In 1973, researchers arrived on a remote windswept island in the Galapagos known as Daphne Major. What they didn't know was that this two-year trip would last almost 30 years and revolutionise our understanding of evolution itself. Because when they were studying the finches of Daphne Major, something strange happened. In just a few short years, a completely new species evolved right in front of their eyes. But it wasn't the first and only instance of natural selection observed in real time. All over the world, species are adapting at speeds previously thought impossible. So how fast can evolution get? Well, instead of taking eons, in the most extreme cases, evolution can occur in mere days. Our story begins in the 1800s, just as Charles Darwin was piecing together his theory of natural selection. As the Industrial Revolution took off, coal burning factories started spewing huge amounts of soot into the air, coating England's countryside in a blanket of haze. For creatures that relied on light-coloured vegetation for camouflage, this was a death sentence. And no animal was as threatened as the peppered moth. These animals were masters of the skies, their light speckled wings blended seamlessly on tree trunks. But in 1811, a strange moth appeared, an entirely new moth. This version was neither pale or speckled, but instead a deep black, a melanistic form that contrasted with the lichen-coloured vegetation at the time. The black morph standing up from its surroundings meant that it was very easy for birds to spot, and in 1848 they represented just 0.001% of the population. But as the skies darkened and the land became shrouded in soot, the black morph gained a significant advantage. By 1864, the tables had turned in their favour. In just 16 years, black morphs went from the minority to the majority, thriving in the industrialised landscapes. And as the century came to its end, melanistic peppered moths made up an astounding 98% of the population. This sudden shift was so dramatic that even famed biologist Charles Darwin didn't think it was possible. Now, thanks to modern technology, we can understand how such rapid evolutionary change was possible. Because recently, scientists found something special about their genes. The moth melanism was controlled by just a single genetic switch, making the mutation more likely to occur. But the peppered moth doesn't just live in Europe, in fact, it is found across the entire Northern Hemisphere, and shortly after Britain's Industrial Revolution, North America had its own. Yet again, the peppered moth became darker, although due to the lower population density, the impact wasn't as severe. As we all know, the Industrial Revolution ended, bringing lighter trees and lichens back, favouring the white moths once again. Almost immediately, the black moths dwindled and are now extremely rare. Evolution due to pollution on land can get pretty fast, but in the water, it can get even faster. And this time, it was the ending of the Ice Age that set in motion a path through rapid natural selection. As the glacier retreated, the meltwaters formed a vast network of lakes. Among these was Lake Washington, a deep expanse of water that soon became home to a variety of fish, including the three-spined stickleback. Fast forward 11,000 years and a metropolis is growing around the lake shores, Seattle. As the city grew, so did the volume of pollution being pumped into Lake Washington. By the mid-20th century, Lake Washington was drowning in sewage, its once clear waters choked with algae blooms. This green sludge left sunlight unable to penetrate through the water, leaving plants to shrivel up and stop producing oxygen. Yet, amid the crisis, the stickleback fish thrived. The year-round darkness concealed them from predators like trout, which rendered their protective bony plates unnecessary. Fish with less armour spent less energy maintaining it, meaning they required fewer resources, giving them the advantage. By the 1960s, scientists discovered that only 6% of the stickleback retained their full armour. But just after came a monumental shift. A $170 million cleanup project diverted away sewage. Slowly, the algae receded, sunlight reached the water's depth, and aquatic plants started to flourish once more. This, of course, was terrible news for the stickleback. Their main predator, the trout, exploded in numbers. Scrambling to adapt, the evolutionary pendulum swung back, and in just a decade, the proportion of stoklebacks with armor surged from 60 to 50%. This reversal could take place so quickly because they still kept their ancestral genes, and it was only a matter of switching them back on. Both the peppered moth and stickleback only changed because of human intervention, and neither of them became a new species. But can natural evolution happen fast enough for us to see it unfold with our own eyes? Could we actually witness the birth of a new species in real time? To try and answer these questions, in 1973, biologists Peter and Rosemary Grant embarked on a journey to the island of Daphne Major. This large rock was the perfect natural laboratory for studying evolution. 
Marked by a central crater with cliffs that gently slope into the sea, Daphne Major was, and still is, devoid of trees. Its climate oscillates between periods of intense drought and torrential rain, impacting the inhabitants and giving them no choice but to adapt or die. Upon arriving, the Grants noticed the air was filled with the chirping of finches, and began collecting huge amounts of data about them. Easy to catch, and with beaks that adapt to a particular food source, the small birds were the perfect case study. In 1977, just four years after the Grants began their research, a brutal drought gripped Daphne Major. Devoid of rain and with the sun baking the ground, nearly all the seeds disappeared. The smallest of the seeds were the first to vanish, devoured by the desperate birds. And so only those that could crack open the remaining large tough seeds could survive the harsh conditions. The results were devastating. The number of medium ground finches and common cactus finches plummeted. But after meticulously measuring beak sizes in subsequent years, the Grants discovered a remarkable change. The survivors had on average noticeably larger and more powerful beaks, an adaptation that would allow their descendants to thrive and restore their population to its former numbers. A little while later, in 1981, a new chapter of Daphne Major's evolutionary story began, a strange bird arrived. His shiny black feathers gleamed in the sunlight, and his call was deeper and more melodic than any native finch. This new arrival named Big Bird held a huge advantage. He was the only finch capable of eating almost everything the island had to offer. Small and large seeds, cactus nectar and pollen were all on the menu. His very diet allowed him to thrive for 13 years, raising offspring throughout his life. The same traits that made him so successful were passed down onto his children, who also thrived. But unlike their father, these hybrids only mated within their lineage, preserving all of their ancestors' characteristics for generations to come. So where did Big Bird actually come from? Well, at first it was thought he flew in from Santa Cruz, but genetics trace his origin to the distant island of Española, over a hundred kilometers away. This migrant found himself a paradise brimming with food, Sensing his good fortune, he decided to never leave. Today, Big Bird's descendants are considered by many to be a completely new species. They're neither medium ground finches nor Española cactus finches, they're completely unique. With a population of just 30, if they were described tomorrow, they would rank among the rarest creatures on the Earth. Yet, Big Bird's arrival was not the only discovery on Daphne Major. In 1983, eight months of relentless rain transformed the ecosystem. Sparse vegetation gave way to dense greenery, and smaller softer seeds became the island's dominant food source. But in 2003, a drought like the one in 1977 changed everything. You might assume that this would favour the smaller beaked birds, who ate the more abundant smaller seeds. Yet nature had other plans. By then, large ground finches had established themselves on Daphne Major. Over several generations, their beaks had shrunk in order to take advantage of small seeds. What this meant was that when the drought hit, there was already intense competition. Rather than one species outcompeting the other, medium ground finches adapted to only eat the tiniest seeds, carving out an even narrower niche for themselves. But evolution is always going to be faster when we intervene. And in 1971, Croatian scientists wanted to find out what would happen when they introduced a species to an ecosystem that was previously inaccessible. They decided that the Italian wool lizard was the perfect candidate. Not only are they common, but they are highly adaptable and can reproduce fast. That same year, in 1971, Five males and five females were transferred from one small uninhabited island to another. This low founding population meant that genetic mutations could spread rapidly through the colony. Fast forward 20 years later and scientists returned to see the results of the experiment for the first time. Not knowing if they had even survived, as their boat approached, anticipation grew. As they stepped ashore, they found that the lizards had not only survived, but evolved too. For one, they had become significantly larger than those on the outcrawl they originated on. But why? Well, on the other island, the lizards had been feasting on insects. But on their new home, dense with plants, they shifted to a herbivorous diet. This new food source demanded new adaptations. Herbivory allowed the lizards to grow significantly larger. Plants require less energy than insects to catch, leaving the lizards with excess energy to fuel their growth. The switch to a plant-heavy diet may have also contributed to the shrinking of their hind legs, and therefore speed, as they no longer needed to catch fast-moving insects. But more influential, however, was that on the new island, their main predator avoidance strategy changed from running across open surfaces to hiding in dense vegetation. 
But more shockingly however was the development of a completely new feature, Kekal valves. These valves between the large and small intestines slow down food and allow for it to be fermented, meaning that cellulose can be processed into digestible fatty acids. Only found in 1% of reptiles, this rapid development challenged our understanding of how fast evolution can become. But to push evolution to its limits, simply introducing a species to a natural environment isn't enough. That's why in 1993, a groundbreaking selective breeding experiment was started, one that would test the boundaries of how quickly an animal can evolve. The experiment had a simple yet ambitious goal, increase the amount of voluntary wheel running in mice. Each mouse was given a wheel with a small measuring device attached to track the number of rotations, speed and time spent running. Every so often, the individuals with the highest number of rotations were bred together, passing on their impressive stamina. Since the experiment began, 105 generations of these rodents have come and gone, and the results have been extraordinary. The four lineages of selectively bred mice now ran three times as much as the control group. However, what's more interesting is how they accomplished that. Some racked up extra distance by spending a greater amount of time running, whilst others started to run faster. So what adaptations did the mice evolve to help them do so? Physically speaking, the running mice became lighter, making them faster and increasing their stamina. But the most influential change was instead to their brain. The running mice had altered their motivation and reward systems, as those requiring more stimulation ran a lot more than those who needed less. Unfortunately, there are limits to observing evolution, as even the fastest reproducing animals can only have a few generations a year. But in the microscopic world, there's one organism that can evolve at a pace unlike anything we've ever seen, reaching up to seven generations a day, bacteria. Their fast reproduction rate means progression can occur faster than in any other organism. And to test the limits on evolution, in 1998, Dr. Richard Lensky started what would become the longest running study on evolution. The long-term E. coli evolution experiment's purpose was to find out how evolution operates over tens of thousands of generations. To begin, 12 identical E. coli populations were placed in flasks with a small amount of glucose. And every day since then, without fail, 1% of each lineage is transferred to a new flask once again. To date, the bacteria have gone through 80,000 generations, and as you'd expect, some big changes have occurred. One of the first major developments was that they evolved to grow faster, helping them exploit their new resources when they moved into a different flask. And this didn't just happen in one or two populations, but in every single one. And while convergently evolving, the ability to grow faster was expected, Around generation 30,000, a much more unexpected ability appeared. At some point, a single lineage evolved to metabolize citrate in the presence of oxygen. This was huge. Previously, their only food source was glucose, but now they had access to a completely untapped resource. Around 10,000 generations later, the citrate metabolizing lineage had outcompeted all others in the population, causing them to go extinct. However, extinction doesn't mean an animal completely disappears. Beneath the Arctic's permafrost sits an ancient world frozen in time. In my last video, I covered some of the most amazing discoveries found in the permafrost. Click this video to find out more.